This is American Business Heroes, and we're here on our Beer and Business Friday news show. And, of course, with beer and business, you have to have the beer, right? So cheers, Rachel. Cheers. All right. All right. So I hope everybody's having a great day today. We are going to talk about some uh, interesting things this week in the business world and as it pertains to what's going on, you know, in our world and, and what what the heck is happening with all this, th these, these ads that are coming out that are defining groups politically one way or, or the, the other. And is that right? And should businesses actually do something like that? So, you know, we're going to start with the gift that keeps on giving, Clark which is Bud Light. So Bud Light plummets to 14th place amongst beers. And at the very same time, Anheuser-Busch CEO pleads for consumers to think about the 65,000 employees that are affected, impacted by the boycotts. And this has been probably one of the most interesting boycotts in recent years, if not in history. The reason is it's gotten more effective as time's gone on. Usually boycotts, if they work at all, are the most effective at the beginning. And then as time goes on, it just wears off. People lose interest. But I think with Bud, with Bud Light, they came out and the first are down 10, 15, 20%, all the way up to 30% down because all during that time, everybody just kept waiting for them to come out and apologize, and they just refused to apologize. So you're talking about Bud Light that came out and directly put a video out, put an advertisement out that offended their base, directly offended it. And this is what you have. And you end up with Molson, Coors, Bev, companies up 32% year to date. Uh, you know, just imagine going from one year to the next, you know, being in first place in the beer world and dropping to 14th place. I mean, that is crazy, isn't it? Rachel, what do you think? Well, I think you nailed it, you know. You know your demographics, know who you're selling to, and most people that drink their their beer are very conservative, and, and that ad and advertisement went totally against most of their beliefs. So basically, you've set yourself up to offend the people that you do most of your business with. So I think they are, um, I, at this point, I, I know a lot of people that just have refused to continue to buy their beer, and I'm not sure that that will change. And I think that's why Coors and, you know, even, even PBR is higher than Bud Light at this point. So I, I'm not sure that it's going to get a lot better unless they come out and, and apologize. Yeah, and you got you have to you really have to wonder. Do you think that Bud Light's going to go away? I mean, are they just going to disappear off the shelves? What do you think? I mean, I would think at some point they would either either get the hint that that they need to apologize, that they need to make this right. Maybe people will forget about it. You know, maybe it'll be one of those things that just over time people just kind of well, whatever, get over it. But but I, I'm not sure the trend it's going right now. It's not looking good for them. No. It's definitely, it's not looking good. And if we go on to uh, our next page here, if it could get any worse, Costco has placed what they call the Death Star on Bud Light cases and price tags. And if you're not familiar with the Death Star or the Star of Death, it means they will not stock the beer again. So this has been confirmed at several stores nationwide. Uh, is it gonna be every store? Well, we really don't know. But, you know, when you look at marketing programs, and we're talking about major corporations, major brands that are out there, when they do marketing programs, I mean, hey, they're stepping out and hoping to get maybe a 2 to 3% bump. And if they do get that, then it's very, very effective for them. Uh, just think of a marketing program that sends your brand on a free fall downward. I mean, so what do you what do you do at this point? And is there anything you can think of, Rachel? 
uh, like we said, maybe apologize, maybe, you know, admit that they realized that they, you know, went the wrong direction with advertising, go back to their more patriotic advertisements that they used to do. You know, they used to have the big Clydesdale horses. Everybody loved those. Um, I, I maybe go that route and see if that can help kind of bump them back up. Yeah. I, I just keep thinking about the real men of genius and that would be the first thing I would do. I would come out with a new episode of The Real Men of Genius, and it would be about the uh, marketing director and all the screw-ups that she did coming out of the gate there. And just because people like to see you poke fun at yourself, and I think if Bud Light would come out and say, guess what, guys? We really screwed up, and we're going to poke fun at ourselves. We're going to have a little bit of fun with this and get everybody back on board. I think they would jump it up maybe 10, 15, 20%. It's not all going to come back, you know, at once, but they could, they could come out just like you're saying, Rachel, they could come out and they could apologize and gain uh, a double digit increase back from that. But you know what? Speaking of a Bud Light moment, uh, so Ben and Jerry's, wow. They said, hey, Bud Light, hold my beer. <laughs> so on the 4th of July, Ben and Jerry's decided to put this post out here. Let me scroll down so you can see this post. Came out on the 4th of July. There it is at the top. The United States was founded on stolen indigenous land. This 4th of July, let's commit to returning it. So what happened? Well, they lost $2 billion in market cap, cap. And also Don Stevens, chief of the Nulhagen Band of the Cusick, a Aban nation, <laughs> stated that they would like to have their land back that lies just below the Ben and Jerry's headquarters. So, you know, they put this thing out there and the indigenous tribesmen of the area where the headquarters says, okay, thanks, we'll take our land back. <laughs> Whoops. Well, you know, here's the thing. Why stop at the Native American Indians? Why don't we go back to the Clovis people? Because they were the ones that migrated over from Russia when the Bering Strait was frozen, eventually ending up in North America. North America, and the Indians eventually took the land over from them. So if we're going to go back, you know, why don't we just keep going back? Is I mean, isn't this crazy, Rachel? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's it's just it's just this big push for politics and you know political stances and all these companies and and consumers don't care. They don't want to necessarily have to know what a brand's politics stand for. They just want the product and all these politics and agendas are being pushed on people. And I think people are starting to push back a little bit. Yeah, I think so too. And here's the, you know, here's the thing. So <clears throat> Bud Light, they have their, their marketing, marketing demographic, which is a section of the United States. And it's not everybody, right? There anybody, I mean, most companies have a very specific market group to go after. And sometimes that marketing group can be on the smaller side. Bud Lights is large, but still it's not everybody. Ben and Jerry's, they pretty much cover the whole nation. And so you have to ask yourself, why do these companies even want to get involved with politics? I mean, why? initiate that conversation because Bud Light takes their target audience, which is bad enough, and just says, well, we don't care about you. Then Ben & Jerry's comes out. Their target audience could be pretty much anybody that eats ice cream. I mean, it's good stuff. Have you ever had it, Rachel? Absolutely. Yeah. So their target audience is anybody that eats ice cream. So if you come out and you, you take a political stance, and then you divide your whole base in half. So you just kill half of your audience. And it just doesn't make any sense to me at all. I mean, you guys in the comments, you know, tell me what you think. You know, are they, is there any good that can come out of this stuff? I just don't see it. 
Go back to promoting your business, promoting your product. Go back to making people feel good about themselves. Be positive and don't divide because you're not going to get anywhere. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. So let's go on. The next news topic this week, we got to talk about inflation because, oh my gosh, we do have a hot spot and the hot spot is in Florida, Miami, Florida, Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach, highest inflation of any metropolitan area up 9%. But what we want to talk about also is the fact that, hey, inflation in June was only 3%. Well, that's terrific, isn't it? No, it's not. Now, <laughs> I'll tell you why. The media comes out with these stories and we've been running inflation anywhere from 3% up to 9%. We had a whole year where it was really, really bad. So they come out and they tell you the uninformed audience and they're pretending like and hoping like you don't even think for yourselves, which I'm sure you do. They're saying, hey, inflation is great. It's only 3%. Well, the problem was that, that June last year was 9%. So what you need to do is take two years and say over the last two years, it's up 12%. The last two years, up 12%. It's only good if we have deflation. So a lot of times these messages come out and they really are hoping that you're not watching, you're not paying attention, you're not thinking for yourself. In order to get back to where we were, we can't have any inflation. We have to have deflation, actually. So why is Florida so high? Well, the growing population is pushing inflation up. Work from home trend has people moving all across the country. So let's say, as an example, prior to COVID 2020, you were working in an area that was just okay. But then your job switches from work at the office to work from home. So suddenly you just need an internet connection at that point. So you decide to pack it up yourself, your family, whomever, and move someplace. So here are the top five places that are gaining population. Number one, Florida. Number two, Idaho. Number three, South Carolina. Number four, Texas. And number five, South Dakota. Well, Rachel, why in the world would anybody want to go to Idaho? No offense, Idaho. I'm sure it's great. <laughs> I'm sure it's great. But to pack everything up and go to Idaho. Yeah, I'm not sure Idaho would be my, my top pick. Um, now, Florida, on the other hand, I could get behind. Yeah. <laughs> could get behind Florida, maybe Texas, you know, and South Dakota. You could go out. There's a lot of things to see in Idaho. I do like potatoes. I do like French fries. <laughs> every uh, potato chips yeah. i like all parts of the potato yeah you know when you divide that sucker up and you split out the part that goes to the french fry and the part that goes to the chip and wait a minute that's not how that works is it <laughs> that's more like a chicken yeah there you go you divide up the parts and you go from there but yeah so that's what's happening there the interest rates up three percent they're saying, they're telling you, this. You don't think for yourselves, it's all great, everything's wonderful, it's down to 3%. No, it's up 12% over the last year. You know, you see it at the grocery store, right? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You know, it's like you go from, your prices are not coming down. So, you know, they're telling you inflation's looking better, it's looking better. Well, nobody, I'm certainly not seeing it. I'm not sure if you are, but, you know, when I go to the store, my the prices have been the same or going up for the last couple of years. So it's, it's, it, it might not be actively jumping the 9% that it was last year, but it, it, it's certainly not coming down or benefiting us at this point. No, I mean, yeah. Oh, it's great. It's only up 3%. <laughs> yeah. It's up. That's the whole key of this whole thing. All right. Now, well, while we have everybody here watching, I want to tell you that if you have a business, and you're concerned about what the heck is going on with your business, I have a free masterclass that's entitled Three Powerful Ways to Recession-Proof Your Business and Thrive in Any Economy. I've been doing this stuff for 35 years, multiple businesses, 
everyone I'm successful. And I can tell you that over that time, I've seen pretty much everything. And the one thing I've noticed that no matter what happens with the economy, there's always a business or two that doesn't just survive it, but it seems like they get even better. And a lot of times I know when I've been hit with these challenges over the years, fires and floods and everything else that it puts you in a situation where you need to think out of the box. You really have to get creative and come up with stuff to increase your uh, potential audience, increase your sales, uh, make your your uh, affordability and your bottom line better. So I put, a, put, I put this master class together. We're going to cover a ton of different subjects, a ton of different examples that I'm just going to give away for free so you guys can use them. And I promise you, just go to AmericanBusinessHeroes.com forward slash masterclass and sign up. It's all free. All right. So moving on here, we have Domino's Pizza. So Domino's Pizza, they came out and they said, hey, we're going to partner with Uber Eats which you might think, well, that's really not a big deal. I mean, everybody does it, right? Well, Domino's, you know, they deliver their own pizza. So to come out and say, we're going to open it up for other people to deliver it also, is kind of a big deal. So shares soared in the news, 10% in early trading. Uh, as of 7.12, it was up 11.5%. And here's the thing. The CEO of Domino's originally said in 2019 that third-party delivery would just simply fade away. Then what happened in 2020, Rachel? COVID. COVID. And so, <laughs> so everybody was getting food delivered because you couldn't go in and eat anywhere. And people were utilizing third-party deliveries because uh, it was more accessible. They were getting it quicker. Um, and so it just kept growing and growing and growing. And I think Domino's realized that, A, the comment that they made was wrong. So he admitted or, you know, accepted that that what he thought for seed was going to happen did not happen. And and they're they're getting with the times. They're making changes and it's obviously going to benefit them. Yeah. So COVID, it's, it, it really is, it really was a strange period because it made so many changes in the business world. There were businesses that were horribly affected that there were businesses that just got killed because of COVID, but then there were other businesses that it actually kind of helped. Uh, one thing that it definitely did do was it changed buying patterns. It changed buying habits. And whenever you have like a hard reset where you can make changes like that, you have to be aware. So, you know, restaurant owners at the time uh, went to delivery either by themselves or th through a third party and it definitely helped all those different third-party delivery places. So, yeah, they followed in Little Caesars' footsteps. Um, Little Caesars joined Uber Eats in April, and they're the, actually the third largest pizza company in the U.S. So we'll keep an eye on that. We'll see how that works, and I think that it's going to benefit them, and pretty much everybody's going to going to kind of forget about it and just pull up the app for Uber Eats and get their Dom Domino's pizza that way, possibly. All right. Our final story of Friday, this is really kind of zoomed on. It's been fun. So our, our final story is actually a company called Venn Hub that we wanted to talk about. And what Venn Hub is, if you watch the video here as it goes across, it's a pop-up convenience store. It's 24-7. The store can be delivered anywhere. They're saying it can run on solar power or electricity. I call BS on that because if it has any type of cooling at all, it would just have to have a massive field of solar uh, cells to be able to power the, the cooling systems for re refrigeration or freezing. So <clears throat> maybe it'll keep the lights on or something. But anyhow, it can be set up in seven days. They come uh, custom stocked with your choice of products. And they already have 44 million in pre-orders from entrepreneurs to utilize this great deer, this great idea. Looking at shopping malls, music festivals. I don't know. What else do you think, Rachel? I think it's a genius idea. I mean, it's literally just like a large scale vending machine. I'm, you know, I'm thinking RV resorts, um, you know, campgrounds, music festivals, 
any kind of festival, really. Uh, it's essentially just a way that people can, you know, get get goods that they need. You don't have to pay employees um, because it's all touchless. It's all computer. So it's 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 a great way to make money. Yeah, I mean, my gosh, no labor, no labor costs. Um, so, you know, depending on how this thing's actually structured, and I don't know if there's any out there actually working right now for they're just in the pre-order stage. But, you know, obviously one of the things that you have to look at would be theft. And um, and it, it, if, it's too, if it's truly automated, then there should be like a drop box area where you stand and a screen that, that they're showing where you, you pick your product out and the arm just grabs the product, throws it in the box and, and you don't get it until you pay for it. So yeah, it, it, it would be fantastic for a lot of different areas. And Rachel, you mentioned like a RV resort, uh, maybe a, a golf course. And uh, so we're, <laughs> we actually have a golf course in our business and we're working on putting in an RV resort. So this would be cool to have something like that sitting there where people could just walk out at 3 a.m. when they get the you know they get a little bit hungry or whatever. They want a soft drink or they want a bag of chips. They can run out and get it. So, yeah, I mean, I think it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see how this thing grows and, and moves on. The other thing that's going to be interesting, though, is this the whole thing about the automation. Uh, where is that going to stop? Uh, I've seen White Castle that uses some uh, robotic uh, chefs, cooks, or that actually puts the meat down, puts the onions on it, flips it when needed, and it's all automatic. I've seen in also restaurants where you have uh, robots that are delivering food uh, to the table and you have robots that are taking the empty uh, plates back to the kitchen. So we really are moving into a different era here where we're going to have all these automated things that are going on. And all I can say is uh, just learn and educate yourself, be open to new ideas, and don't be in a position where you're going to end up with your job taken away. And I don't think jobs are going to be taken away. Like servers at restaurants, we all want to have that personal interaction. Don't you think, Rachel? Yeah, I don't, I don't really foresee that going away. I do think though, as a business owner, that is something that, that you have to be open to, you know, I don't think people are going to necessarily totally lose their jobs, but I do think businesses that, that refuse to kind of get with the times and increase their technology, I think that they could suffer from it eventually. Yeah, exactly. So owning a restaurant, I would, I would see a robot working with the server because I mean, you, we've all seen it. When you have a table of customers there and they're bringing the plates out, I've seen these servers put a massive amount of food on trays or on their arms and they stack it up and bring it out to the table. I would foresee that automated, that robot, you know, bring the food out with the server. And then when it comes time to take the plates back to the kitchen, the server comes out, checks with everybody, make sure they're done. If they need anything else and then stack those plates on the, robot to go back to the kitchen. So I could see that making it easier on a server. And also it would be, um, they probably could handle a few more tabletops that way as well. So that's it for our beer and business Friday today. I want everybody to have a terrific week and weekend and keep plugging along. If you're in business, you're an entrepreneur, know that you're not by yourself. If you need any help, reach out to me sign up for the master class it's absolutely free and we'll have a good time with that rachel thanks for being here as well thank you see you next friday all right we'll see everybody next friday one o'clock